here to share their expertise. Um, it's going to be a little bit different, so we're going to have 20 minutes of discussion, and then we're going to have an extended Q&A session. Um, so this will be a chance to really engage in a conversation and get to those questions answered. Um, so moderating, we have Sue Pilato um, on our panel. We have Jenna Kagan, Jim Kierstead, Jenna Robbins, and Larry Rogowski. And I'll let Sue take it from here. Okay, can I just do a show of hands for the room? Who in the room considers themselves a writer? Okay, very good. Who in the room considers themselves a director? Okay, any producers? Any actors? Oh, yeah, the, the wildest hands. They go right up. Okay, great. Have I forgotten anything? Songwriter. Songwriters and composers. Wait, I, I heard that. That was very melodic. Any slashers in the room? Do we have any slashers in the room? You know what a slasher is, right? I'm a songwriter, composer, producer, actor, director, but what I really want to do is write. Okay, so I'd like to introduce you to our panel of slashers. Everybody here has another identity, uh, a specific background that led us to the world of producing. It wasn't like when we were five, you know, my sister said I want to be a firefighter and I said I want to be a producer. So you're going to hear a little bit about everybody's backgrounds and how we got to this crazy world of producing. Um, but I will tell you, producers in general are very, very good. We're great at talking about our shows. We're not as good at talking about ourselves. So it is okay if I make these guys brag a little bit. Is that all right? Yes. Okay. Panelists, will you please raise your hand if you've ever been nominated for a Tony Award? <laughs> Panelists, will you raise your hand if you've ever won a Tony Award? <laughs> I've got to narrow this down because I'm trying to pick my first speaker. Okay, panelists, if you've ever won a Tony Award for being a lead producer, what? Uh, <laughs> and you saw that, right? John was like, <laughs> we're going to start with Janet Kagan. So, Janet, you won your Tony Award for, oh, sorry, you have to pick them. I'm sorry, you won your Tony Awards for? <laughs> for Pippin and Pohemus. And which one's your favorite? I'm just kidding. You can't do that. <laughs> it's like asking, who's your favorite child? And, oh, I'll tell you mine. Um, <laughs> so it's interesting. I'll tell you mine and see. I, I want to hear, and I think you guys want to hear too, the difference between being a lead producer on Broadway, which basically means you are responsible for the whole shebang. You source the thing, you're responsible for financing the thing, you have relationships with the theaters, you have relations, you choose everybody who's on the title card. I'll get that in a minute. Um, and you are sort of now at this point kind of working backwards in a great way. You went from the top of the pyramid and now you're producing off Broadway, and I get to, I want to give you guys a visual. Is that okay? Visual. Visual. What does it say? Gloria. Gloria, a life. Okay. Will you tell us about the journey from going backwards from Tony Award-winning producer to producing a beautiful, intimate off Broadway show? Sure. Um, well, uh, it's it's sort of a little bit of a personal story because. Uh, the last show that I lead produced um, with my husband Howard uh, was The Great Comet. Um, Natasha Beard, The Great Comet, great teacher. Um, when I closed, it was, um, it was very emotional for me. And, um, you know, when you're a producer, you're like the CEO of a company. You've got a lot of employees that are depending on you. you you're, uh, you're running your marketing, advertising. Um, all of those people have jobs because of your show, because of you. And um, it, was a, it was a difficult time, so I took some time off. And uh, then when I uh, finally buried you know, the, the, the hard um, emotional part, I tried to think about what I wanted to do going forward, and I loved, I still love theater, and I wanted to go back, but I wanted to form a company that had a very specific mission, and um, and I wanted to do it myself. So I formed a company called uh, Fearless Productions, and uh, with a partner, we um, we are co-producing Gloria, so I'm not a lead producer. Daryl Roth is the lead producer. I'm one of four co-producers on it. And um, our mission is to help provide opportunities for women in theater. So, um, <laughs> so 
So when I say opportunities for women, I mean both on the stage and off the stage. So uh, writers, directors, producers. Gloria is an all-female uh, producing team, creative team, um, acting. Uh, all the actors are, are female. Um, so that's, that's how I went from being a lead producer with my husband to starting my own company and now um, a co-producer off Broadway. Will you just tell them in two sentences why they need to see Gloria Life, please? Oh, gosh, I um, wish I had an hour. But uh, I just think it's a really important piece of history, um, especially right now with what we're experiencing in, um, in our communities and in the country and uh, in, in our industry, in, in all industries. And I think the work that Gloria did uh, throughout her life, and she's still alive, and she's still beautiful, um, and the people that she worked with to, um, to fight for equality, gender equality, and um, equal pay for um, all sexes uh, has, has not really not been recognized. And there are some people in the play that you discover were uh, important um, components of, of, a, of, of the movement. So. Uh, it's just a very timely play. It's, it's a beautiful story about her life and what, what um, drove her to become and do what she does. And there, we even, we even let men produce things that are really upstanding and impressive works for women. So going down our line, Jim Kirstead just produced Unexpected Joy. I think, who saw Unexpected Joy at the York? Where have you people been? <laughs> Seriously. That's okay, you can see it in London. It's also now being translated into Spanish, am I right? Yeah, yeah so translated into Spanish. Jim, Jim, I'm gonna try to do all your shows that are on Broadway right now. Tell me if I forget any. Does anybody know about Kinky Boots? <laughs> That's a Jim Kirstead show, my friends. American Sun, currently just opened. Obnoxiously rave reviews. And um, Pretty Woman, Waitress, I, I should just list whatever's on Broadway, and Jim Kirsten is a co-producer on it. But actually, you're known for being a developer of new works. Can you talk about that journey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm really glad that Sue got that show of hands before so we could see who's out in this audience, because it's super helpful and you know, kind of talking to you. Um, about 20 years ago, I had some friends. I come from the business world, and I had an IT career for several decades. And about 20 years ago, some friends of mine were working on a new musical, and they needed some help. It was financial help and you know, just support and extra person, extra set of eyes and hands in the room. And I went through the process with them from the audition process to putting together readings and whatnot for this piece. And I had such a great time. It was so gratifying for me to be able to work on a project from the ground up like that that you know, I honestly thought that was probably the only time I would do it, and I would just go back to my IT work, but for whatever reason, opportunities kept presenting themselves, and I just really got into the whole um, you know, flow of, of finding new work that I really responded to and taking it through the developmental process. And I think that as a producer, I think that you can choose you know, how you want to fit into this world of theater, and some people want to raise money and go to opening nights, and some people want to find new projects, and you know, whether it's for Broadway, or whether it's off-Broadway, whether it's TV and film, which are really starting to cross over with theater these days. Um, and I think you get to choose, you know, how you want to be a part of this world. So it's been interesting for me is I've, I've done several different, um, I've worn several different hats, including you know uh, co-producing on Broadway shows, but you know my real love is finding new work and bringing artists um, forward and getting their work seen. And you know there are just so many talented people out there. And I think that what's so important is you have to do things that your taste dictates, um, and you have to really learn what your taste is over the years. And that's something that I do. You know, and it's like in you guys, there's there are a lot of writers here. And there's certainly a lot of producers in this room as well. And what I think you know is important for you guys is to kind of match up. Writers have to find a producer who believes in what they're saying, and the producer has to find a writer who's writing what they want to produce. And when you can do that, you know, it's like just it gets frustrating, I'm sure, as a writer to be able to try to find somebody who has the similar taste, who wants to work on your project. But I suggest don't give up, right? Because you really want to keep finding just the right person. It's like dating and finding that right relationship. And 
what I always recommend people do is if you have a piece out there, look look on the internet, like find people who have produced a show that resembles yours in a way, you know, because you'll find somebody who has that kind of taste and those are maybe a good place to start with, um, you know, if you're, if you're trying to find people. And, um, you know, so anyway, that's what I've been doing for these last 20 years or so, and it's um, with unexpected joy, Bill Russell, who wrote that, he's, you know, a good friend of mine from Sideshow, when that was originally on Broadway, so we developed that over the course of six years with three different readings in the, in the city. Um, on, on the board of the York Theatre Company, so we did a bunch of that development over there, and then we did a production up in Wellfleet, and we finally had our production um, this past spring at the York, and then we did it over in London at the Southwark Playhouse, and that just got published by Samuel French, and we did a cast recording. So, anyways, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Front Row, for that applause. Um, you guys, so that you don't get inundated in email land, because now every single person in the room is like, this is a guy I want to work with. How, how, what is the best way for people to either yes, contact you, or no, absolutely not contact you, if they want to get, right? Because that's, that's one of the reasons you're here. Like, is there, is there an effective way for you, how do you go and find your next passion project? You know, a lot of it is about relationships, I find. Um, you know, just during the course of my days, I, I meet a lot of people, a lot of playwrights and directors and whatnot. And I think it's, you know, finding people that you have chemistry with and people who are working on projects that you respond to. You know, usually something that I work on has to do with diversity and um, I'm, not, I'm not somebody who would ever engage in like a political debate with somebody because I don't think that's a really great way of, of getting people to change their minds. But I put out a piece of theater that has a message to it, and then I feel like you know people get messages through entertainment, and when their when their defenses are down, so that's my best way of doing that. So yeah, I like to find things that are meaningful. Um, I tend to you know look at projects that really are about diversity and are about you know bringing social issues to the surface. Um, so that's the kind of work I look for. But I you know I have a lot of colleagues and a lot of friends who I've you know went over the years who I really support their work. Um, but yeah, I, I will listen to people who's, who have um, you know, pieces that I respond to, you know, but it's just there's a lot of people in the world, so there's, there's only one opinion. So. I just want to translate what Jim just said. Chances are good if you email him, he won't respond. Is that right? Or you'll say, thank you so much, I'm very busy? No, I always appreciate people sending me things, but you have to also understand that you know, it's, there's I'm one human being and there's a lot of people in the world, so I would always listen to it. If it's intriguing, I'll... I'll write back and usually I'll write back and say I'm kind of busy right now. But but if it's something I like, yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I usually respond to anybody who writes to me. Um, at least listen to it. And if it's something really intriguing, I'll say send it over. I'll read it. What's your email? <laughs> <laughs> you can look at my website. It's KirstenProductions.com, and it's on there. Um, is this one we mentioned who on the panel is single and who isn't? Is that, or is that totally beyond the scope? Okay, so apropos inappropriate things. Does anybody know the Broadway musical Gypsy? Okay, so there are some people who are performers who think, geez, I want to produce something so that I can perform, you know, I can cast myself as a performer. And then there are other people who build serious cred as Broadway performers playing Mazeppa in Gypsy and being the standby for Time Daily going on for over 40 performances, Jenna Robbins. How do you choose between performing in a show, producing a show, and is there ever any crossover? Like, I want to play that role, well, I'm just going to produce it. Well, that's a very interesting question because absolutely there are two separate things for me. Uh, I became a producer because uh, back actually during the time that I was on Broadway and Gypsy, uh, the, so many of my friends um, in the 80s, late 80s, were uh, passing away from AIDS. I started raising money for Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. Uh, doing, uh, but actually at the time it was only Broadway, uh, there was only <coughs> Equity Fights AIDS, there wasn't a Broadway Cares. Um, so I started uh, doing all of these huge events in which I was producing the events and I was raising money and people started saying, wow, you're producing. And I realized that I could make a difference in the world the same way and uh, at that point decided to form a country, a company called... Uh, <laughs> 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 we all get together and 
you back. Um, but, uh, so uh, I formed a company called Better World Productions, and, uh, and my motto was to, and my mission was to present theater that not only entertains and educates, but inspires us to create a better world. So I too see theater as something that really can help our social issues, our political world, and, and, and say something, and those are the kind of things that appeal to me. So I became a producer without realizing that's what I was starting to do and that I had the capacity to do. Uh, during all of this time, I have never produced anything for myself. As a matter of fact, when I was called to see if I wanted to come on as a producer on Drowsy Sa Chaperone, I said to everybody, I said, no, I don't want to produce that. I want to play Drowsy. So when I see a role for myself, I actually back off and I don't become a producer on that because I... I find that I want to keep both things separate. There was one thing one time, a, a world premiere that was created, and I did play the lead, and by that time I had been doing a lot of producing. It's the only time I actually said, I think I would like to produce this starring me. It didn't work. They said it wouldn't work, and it really didn't work. Um, so I, I very rarely do that. We had this experience on Cagney off Broadway where the writer, Bobby Creighton, was also the star. And then, of course, his friends and family said, we'd love to contribute money to this. And he said, is my name going to appear three times on the title page? And then we said, you know what? We think it's probably best if you're a silent producer in this project. So important to know that if, you know, what do you want to be known as in the industry? What do you want to lead with? Because you can have those other skill sets, and they're very useful to have. But make sure you keep the main thing, the main mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Um, so if you want, and your Tony nomination is as a performer, is that right? No, actually my Tony nomination is for Ragtime, as a producer. Well, hang on, I'm talking about your Tony nomination in the future because I've seen you as a performer, so I think, there's <laughs> one, I think there's one showing up. And in fact, if you want to see Jenna Robbins perform, I mean, do you? What, you have a show today? I have a show today. <laughs> <laughs> so Jenna's in a show called This One's for the Girls, at St. Luke's on 46th Street, and if you're lucky, you can buy yourself a ticket and then you can say you know her. What time's the show? Yeah, it's at two o'clock, and it's an amazing oh, show. It's a, it's a, it has a similar feeling to, to Jersey Boys and all the great music that's in it, but it's about female empowerment, our going from dependent to independent, simply through the top 40 songs ever written and performed by women. The reason it's a magnificent show for you to see is because it's moving, it's funny, and it might be one of the best things I've ever been in including Gypsy. Uh, but the reason it's wonderful for me is because I really still do like performing, and it's two performances a week. So a producer can produce all the shows I'm producing right now and just go on stage twice a week. So it's a gift. It's a gift. You know we want to hear all of her performer studies, but that is for another panel. Um, so a, a common theme running through our panel so far is pursuing your passion, maybe giving a little bit of voice to the voiceless, um, Larry, we're going to give you voice to the voiceful because you're the most boisterous person I know, although you've been behaving yourself well till now. So your Tony Award was for Angels in America. Angels in America, yeah. And how do you feel? Yes, yes, yes. And, and so I, I think that's pretty much in keeping with who you are in the world, being able to give a voice to someone who is voiceless. But you went from going being a Broadway co-producer to being a lead producer, and your show opens in approximately 48 hours. Tell us about the differences between Angels in America on Broadway and the other Josh Cohen off Broadway. Sure. Um, okay, this is quite a panel. Hi, guys. So I um, <laughs> so co-producing, you know, it kind of came almost by mistake. Can I tell that quick story? I would is that love yeah? To tell the Yes. The speedo story. It's him in his speedo. Oh, the spe oh, oh that story. Oh, the way. Okay. All right. Whatever story you want. Okay. <laughs> I will tell the speedo story. So I was out in Fire Island last summer. So Angels in America is a show that I saw 25 years ago, originally on Broadway when I was in college. Completely changed my life. Sue, I know, I know Sue for a very long time. We, we do produce together. And um, we talked about Angels in America all the time. When it was coming here from the National Theater in London, I thought, well, I have to be involved in this show. I didn't know anybody involved with the National Theater, so I was like, well, what are we gonna do? I was in Fire Island last summer at, uh, for the Fire Island Dance Festival, and I started having a conversation with a lovely British fellow, and um, it turns out he is um, the, the head of the National Theater in London here in America. Tim. <laughs> Tim, exactly. So we started talking, and I said, I, I would love to be part of Angels in America as a co-producer. He said, well, that's lovely, but we have no room. <laughs> So I was heartbroken. 
So, I, but I was persistent, so I actually followed up with him and met with him, and there was still no room until about a week later when somebody had dropped out, and we were able to get a spot on Angels in America. It was such a dream come true to be part of that, and then, of course, winning, winning uh, my first Tony Award with that show. So, um, so from being a co-producer, you know, so being a co-producer is incredible because that's where you learn the tricks of the trade. It's where you learn how to do it. You, you, you can make mistakes, but they're, they don't matter as much because you're not the lead producer, right? So you get to make all your mistakes and you sit and you watch and you learn, you sit at the table, to now uh, lead producing this uh, incredible show about kindness and uh, what a time for a show about kindness right now, right? Um, called The Other Josh Cohen, which is opening Monday night at the West Side Theater right here on 43rd Street. It is a gift and a joy, and um, I can't say enough about this show. Again, kindness is so necessary right now. You know, everybody talked about the reasons they pick the shows that they pick and what touches them, what, you know, to, to make a, a, a slight dent in, in the world right now, whatever it is. And I love the entryway of, of kindness and how that can move mountains in a very subtle uh, and lovely way. Beautiful. So you've heard their success stories. Would you like to hear their failure stories? Yeah. <laughs> Who would like to go first? Uh, let's, let's mix it up a little bit. Who has an awesome failure story as a producer? I mean, like, super juicy. <laughs> All right, Janet, take it. <laughs> So, um, so the first show that uh, my husband and I, um, we, we started off, as, as you said, you know, you kind of have to take baby steps, and, and uh, um, so we started off as uh, a very small investor in Bonnie and Clyde. We loved the musical, um, uh, really enjoyed the process of learning what it was like to be an investor, and the first night, opening night, um, I think it was the New York Times headline was, Wheel This Barrow Out of Town. <laughs> I kid you not. That was nice compared so, to the King Kong review. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's my, my um, that was the first uh, production that we invested in. Uh, we didn't let it get us down. We love theater. We wanted to do more. and. Uh, just continued on, and then the next show we were involved with was Porgy and Bess. So it was a completely different, different uh, situation. So you got to keep on keeping on. Absolutely. I'll, 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 Larry, you want to take this? I was going to ask anybody, like, what, what keeps you motivated? But Larry, I'll let you take your epic failure first. Well, I was just going to say, it's not even about an epic failure. I mean, we all have them, of course, but um, it's, okay, every successful producer, every successful person, no matter what they do, if you're a writer, an actor, whatever it is, it's all about persistence. If you give up after your first failure, who knows what was right around the corner, the success that was waiting for you. So you, if you have a dream, you have to keep pursuing it in the face of the failures, and they're, they're gonna come. And people are gonna say, you can't do that. Who, if you wanna do it, you have to do it. I actually wanted to say something, and, and I think we all know this even in our lives. Quite honestly, we learn more from our failures what didn't we do right or what happened or what didn't we plan for that did happen to us. And I think that we often learn from those failures, not that we're looking to have them, more than we do from our successes. It all went great, it was a big success, everybody's happy, and did we learn what we did? How did we make that success? I think the lessons are in the failures. So fail more, and do party. <laughs> No, just look for the lesson when it happens, because it ultimately it's going to happen. Yeah, and you know, I think that a failure is defined by why did you do that show, and if you did it because you really believed in it, and it didn't do well commercially or some other way, I don't necessarily consider that a failure. I consider it a failure if you did the show for the wrong reason, and I had a show that I did. Um, the, the very first show that I did all by myself was in 2003, it was called Thrill Me, the Leopold Loeb Story, which I loved, and Martin Charnin, the famous Martin Charnin was our director, and we got to be very good friends, and the following year he asked me if I wanted to produce um, a review of, his, of some of his work that he had done years before, not his own writing, but a compilation of other writers. And I said, well, sure, I said, this is Martin Charnin, he's you know, amazing, we got to be friends. I read the material, and 
I hated it. And I said, like, I absolutely hate this show. But Martin must know. He must know better. So we did this show, and it was horrible, and everybody else hated it too. And when it was over, I learned the lesson. I said, I'm never going to do something again that I don't really love. And if, if you love it and you do it and it doesn't work, then I don't think that's a failure. But I think if you do it for the wrong reasons and it fails, then it's a big failure. And you're going to watch it eight times a week, so please love it at least. Otherwise, that's a very long week. We would love to take questions from the audience. What are your burning desires? I mean, <clears throat> professionally. Just, does anybody? <laughs> Hello. Wait, you have your arm most enthusiastically up, so we'd love to hear from you. Hi. How much does it cost to invest in something to be a producer of it? Can you give me any? Who wants that? We can all take this, Jenna. I, I was just going to say, uh, truly, that depends upon uh, the the production. It depends upon how many lead producers. It depends upon how easy the money is to raise for that uh, that particular show. So there really isn't isn't an answer to your specific question. I'd like to add on to that because I think there's a perception that they're the producer. They're, they've got the very deep pockets. Uh, a lot of producers, myself included, um, don't come from a background of very deep pockets. Like we, we've got, we got to get scrappy, right? And in a way, you know, it, <coughs> there, there's some great um, pot of gold at the end of that rainbow when you do have a success because you know it's not like you're just throwing your money to something. You have to really. Pick projects you truly believe in, like Jim said so beautifully, I think that's key. And then you could talk about it all day long, you could be passionate about it, and um, be able to identify investors who do have the deep pockets, do have the money, and create great relationships to make that happen. One of the things I love to say to potential investors is, when they ask about return on investment, because you guys know, 80% of Broadway shows won't recoup. Isn't that lovely? Um, so what I like to say to my investors is, you are going to have an amazing opening night party. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to add that, uh, yes, and, and I say to my producers that, that uh, it's, it's not just the opening night party, it's the journey. There's so many events and so many ways that you can get involved if you become a co-producer or an investor in a show. It's attending um, perhaps rehearsals. Um, uh, the, the night before the first preview, you have your you know, dress rehearsal, invite only. Um, there are events where you can um, you play a part. If, if you're a co-producer, you can go to marketing meetings uh, once a month, or depending on you know, how, how often the lead producer invites you. But it's a journey. I'd, I'd love to add to that too. Uh, when Jim was talking about don't produce a show you don't love, when I go out to raise money, which was not your question, but when I go out to raise money from investors, I try to find the investor who is also passionate about what this show is saying. So that if for any reason you do not make all of your money back or you don't make a profit, you still had an amazing journey and attached yourself to something that you were very proud of walking around and saying, I'm a producer or I'm an investor, I supported this happening. And to what you also just said, like I'm a producer on Company uh, in, uh, in London right now, which has gotten rave reviews and is actually a very, very big hit. My reason for doing that is because Marianne Elliott, I think, is one of the best female uh, directors there is uh, right now in our business. And I'm producing, I'm lead producer on two shows that I'm taking over to London and felt, wouldn't this be a great way to be working with people at the top of their game and really learning producing in London, which is the primary reason I, I joined the show originally. And then the icing on the cake is, it's a hit, so that's great. <laughs> Hello, sir. Hi, how you doing? Um, I just wanted to say, uh, my name is John Tierney. My show is called Humanity's Child, and I want everybody to remember that. Um, <laughs> I am inspired and motivated because you have been talking about the role of theater as a vehicle for social change. And I have been, all of us, all of us, all of us I'm looking at all of you. Um, you've talked about kindness, you've talked about inspiration and that's what my show is about so I don't know if so much I have a question is that I just want to thank you for validating um, this mission because
for me, it's not about producing a successful show. It's about producing a successful result where people are moved and motivated to make changes in the world. So thank you. Here, here. I can't see you guys, so Hi. I'll choose out in the audience. I was hoping you could talk about finding the right general manager for your projects and um, if you use the same general managers or how do you identify who's right for which show? Um, <laughs> that's that is a key relationship, the general manager, because you're like married to them when you're when you're especially as a lead producer when you're doing a show. So it's about who you have the best relationship with. So I suggest you go out and meet as many general managers as possible. And where are you going to meet them? You know, at maybe I don't know if there's any here today, but events like this, like start to network with these people, ask around the industry, ask other producers that you know who they've liked working with and who they have not liked working with. Because you're gonna learn a lot that way. Um, because that is a tight, tight relationship. Do you guys wanna choose, just because I can't see out there quite so well? Hello, my name is Tyrone Stanley. Um, I am a writer, singer, I am a slasher. slasher. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I went the academic route. I, I went and got a PhD in English and um, fought the Board of Regents to allow me to do a creative dissertation. Um, and it's real thing, the musical, about a trans woman in a male prison. Um, my issue has been, pardon? Is it just a thesis or is it a work? Is it's it a done. I've, I've done two readings. Um, I graduated and I did two readings. I'm also a playwright professor there now. But my issue has been that I found, I found an investor uh, that would be my lead producer, um, but they wanted um, something to change in my script. And my heart, in my heart, I could not make that change. Then that's not the right producer. Then that's not, yeah, I did walk away. So yes, and I, and I, but I felt foolish after because you want the money to go on and go forward. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I could not, they wanted more comedy. The money is what you need to support your dream and to support your project, but you don't change your dream and you don't change your project in order to get the money. Thank you so much. I was just going to add, stay true to yourself, stay true to your work. Thank you. Hi, I want to ask you a question about, uh, it's for Janet, about the Bonnie and Clyde uh, yeah. project. Is, is there life? Is there life after Broadway if you have a failure? Because so, I know it's being produced in, in Texas right now, in Houston, so what happens to the Yeah, project? actually, we, we were just talking about this uh, earlier. <coughs> there are some shows that, and, and I, I see the industry moving in this direction, not every show is destined for Broadway. There are some shows that work really well on the road or work well in, um, in other countries. Um, so I think that, yeah, even if you have something that doesn't do well here, it might do really well in other states. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to mention names of any uh, titles, but there were, there were many shows that did not do well on Broadway but were big hits um, on the road or in other countries. I'll mention the title. That's okay. I was a co-producer on a show that, well, my husband had co-created it called Disaster. That was on Broadway a few years ago with Seth Rodensky. Yeah. Seth is not my husband. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it ran, it, how long did it play? Three months on Broadway? It was off Broadway first, very successful. I mean, it was, hit, I wouldn't say financially successful, but it was a successful, critically successful. On um, Broadway also, you know, New York Times critics picked. Ran for three, maybe four months. The life is now with that show because it got licensed by a licensing company and it's at every high school near you. <laughs> so that's what happens. So every time I look at probably all these guys, when you look at shows, you want to see what's the life beyond New York? Because what's the long tail? And that's a great way to also talk to your potential investors, what's beyond, because that's where a lot of the money can be made. Yeah, I mean, just to go on to that, um... You know, there are various shows like Unexpected Joy that we were talking about before. When we created that, there was never any interest 
for me or you know anybody on our team to have that as a Broadway show. But you know we're living in New York, and everybody in the New York theater community is very New York centric. But we're forgetting that there's a whole country and a whole world out there of people who love theater who want to see shows. So what we end up doing is we brand something by giving it a run in New York, whether it's limited or open ended, whatever it may be. But if we do that, it's sort of like goes and makes everybody in the rest of the world notice that show a little bit more. So it makes it ripe for licensing and uh, touring eventually. And if you have a cast recording for a musical, that's like super important to sell in the future. So yeah, there's a whole world outside of New York. Good morning. I'm Ruth Brody Sharon. I'm the composer and lyricist for Interfaith, the musical. And I'm right at the beginning, and I'm working on the libretto. And you mentioned about looking for new shows, new, new ideas for theater. So at what point do I have to have my production available in order for one of you to say, this has promise, I really want to work on this? Well, I think at certain points, you know, like, I don't know if, I don't know what your status is, you know, who you have attached to your project, you have a director, or you know, if it's a musical director, but I think it's about, you know, finding your team who you feel really comfortable working with, and then do a presentation or a demo of a recording so people can start hearing the music, and then you can start, you know, shopping your script around and the music and, and see if people are interested in being a part of it. And certainly if, you know, you didn't get that, you can do a, do a presentation of it, you know, you can, raise some money and uh, get it done in the festival or do a reading of it and then invite people so they can take a look at what you've got. So I the, think cor the corollary is that I've already released an album with 11 of the songs. Uh, and so, but I haven't finished the libretto, so I sort of did it the other way around. So is it worthwhile to be presenting the song even without the finished production for now? Is that, would that be of interest? Uh I'm just going to jump in. Sorry, I mean, I, I just I see so many changes happening in our industry, and one is that um, there's uh, there's a show coming onto Broadway now. Be more chill. I'm not attached to it, so I'm not. This is not a promo, but they um, they released the music, um, they released fan art, and drew a huge uh, base of fans and. Um, I had the show, it sold out, you know, off Broadway, and um, and now it's coming to Broadway. And it started with because they put the soundtrack out there and <coughs> built up a fan base. And like I said, fan art, it's all about social media and getting that buzz now, even before you have your show. I, I can't agree more with what Janet's saying, because now, the, it's, it's like the Wild West, this world, really. If you want to be really creative as a producer, and um, what, what we did, so with this show that's opening on Monday, the other Josh Cohen, when we, we optioned it, and we, we didn't have a theater yet, and we have these incredible writers who star in the show, by the way, um, David Rossmer and Steve Rosen, and we said to them, guys, while we're waiting for a theater, let's do, let's, let's do an album or something, but we didn't have a cast yet. So they said, well, we have some friends in the industry, so maybe we can call some of them. I said, great, who are your friends? Sutton Foster, <laughs> Hank Azaria, Richard Pine, Brian Darcy James, you know, just a few friends, A.C. Levy, Lindsay Mendez. I said, okay, well, let's call it. So they called them, and we recorded this incredible album with these all-stars that got released before the opening of our show, and it drew all this attention and traffic to our show that if we didn't, most shows will release a cast album after the show's already open, which is great, and then you have your cast. But this, or especially for Off-Broadway, we gotta be a little more scrappy with it, right? Um, on Broadway too, both, and uh, utilizing social media and all these different ways to get ears and eyeballs onto your show. So it was really effective in that way. So yes, get, get that music out there in any way that you can. Hi, uh, how effective is a query letter for you? Or does it have to be the right timing for you looking for something? I don't know what a query letter is. Oh, well then that answers my question. <laughs> <laughs> I want to grab somebody in the front row because you've been waiting for a while, my dear. Come on down. Hi. This is towards uh, Jenna. I'm also an actor and a writer and dabbling in producing. And I know when, when I get cast in an equity show, I love going to the call board, signing my name in my half hour, and doing that run of the show. And my focus is, I'm an actor. Thank God I just show up. Uh, um, 
You're wearing two hats. You're separating your powers here. I know two, two shows a week. I'm sure that's manageable. Could you do a Broadway show and handle this load as a producer? I know. It could, is it too much stress? I think I'd be like stressed a little bit, but I'm just, I'm just right. asking. No, I can't. <laughs> I'd like you, hi, I, I'm a slasher, I'm a director, producer, choreographer. Um, I'd like you to talk to the idea of the war chest, because I think a lot of people think they're going to come in and get great reviews and run. Nine times out of ten, you don't. But a lot of shows have been able to find their audience and have semi-long runs by having a war chest that keeps them open until they find the audience. Could you speak to that? Um, for me, what I think is when you're building a show and you're building a marketing plan, you have all of these different pieces that will help you to keep the show going and to promote the show. So I look at reviews as that, and hopefully we can find some good quotes in our reviews, even if it's not a rave, which is, if it's a rave, that's great, because that just helps the momentum of the piece go forward. Um, and if they're not good reviews, you know, and you probably still, you know, creative marketing people can always find like a quote here and there. And what ends up happening for me is it's sort of like getting a show to be successful or running a show is like getting a jet airplane off of a runway. And you have to build up that momentum to get it off the runway. And what's going to keep it in the air is word of mouth. That's always what's going to sell your show. People have to leave and say, wow, I love that, and telling their friends. Because I know I would be much more likely to go see a show if I'm hearing all this buzz about it from people that I trust rather than just seeing an ad. So I think that ad is great and you need to have that to get the word out initially, but the thing that's gonna keep something going, like when you look at a Wicked or any of these like longer running shows, the thing that people like is that it's just, it's just hit the hearts of people or there's something about it that gets that word of mouth going. So I think obviously the more money you have, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to make up for losses, but it's not a good business plan to be doing that forever, right? It eventually has to be able to fly on its own or you're gonna to have to land. Um, so, yeah. Jim makes a great point. Um, quickly, you mentioned Wicked. Wicked got, well, how many, 15 years ago they said they're 15? They got very mediocre reviews and Avenue Q won the Tony Award that that year. Now they're both still running in New York, but Wicked is Wicked. I mean, it's such a, you know, a <laughs> craziness. Um, so you can get not great reviews and you can get tremendous reviews and not run. Who knows why? Do you guys have an answer? <laughs> Tell me. Unfortunately, we are going to have to find that answer on the break. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much to Sue and Janet and Jim and Jenna and Larry. Literary agents, um, and also stop upstairs in the upper lobby. We have some of our yeah. sponsors up there. Ripley Greer is giving away $300 worth of rehearsal space, so be sure to enter that round. <laughs>